Hi, my name is Sarah Michaels and I'm an F1 at Kingston Hospital. This is a podcast about leg ulcers, which you might find popping up in various hospital stations like dermatology, cardiovascular, diabetes and neurology, and of course the written papers. So the objectives of this um, presentation is to look at the most common types of leg ulcers that you're likely to encounter as a doctor and also to become familiar with the differences in etiology, appearance and also the treatment of the most common types of leg ulcers. So how I'll do this is we'll look at, we'll just do an introduction and look at categorization of leg ulcers, then go into a bit more detail about the etiologies, about the history that you might take from a patient, the examination of leg ulcers, and then investigations you would want to do, and then looking at general and specific management. So just as an introduction, about 1-2% to of the UK population will have a leg ulcer at some point. It's more, more common in the elderly and more so in women than men. Now the figure does rise to about 15% in those with diabetes, so it is a big problem. What is particularly problematic is that they do take a while to heal and 50% of leg ulcers are actually open for about 9 to 12 months and 8% are open for over 5 years. So over the course of that time you're going to need a lot of MDT involvement. So the teams that you might be working with or the team members would be the community nurse, podiatrists, dermatologists, tissue viability nurses, microbiologists, diabetic foot clinic nurse, GP, vascular surgeons, orthopaedic surgeons and orthotists. Now you're not always going to be involved with all those team members, it really does depend on the type of ulcer that you're dealing with. So ulcer means partial or complete loss of epidermis. Now there are three main types and they are venous, arterial and neuropathic. You can get some other ulcers such as pressure ulcers, those which come about from trauma, infection, you can get pyoderma gangrenosum in those with, in, with inflammatory bowel disease, the vasculitides can le lead to skin ulcers, skin cancer as well is, is an important differential and also steroid use. Now the thing is about categorization of leg ulcers is that very often they are mixed and most often they are mixed venous and arterial but usually one type does predominate. So we've looked at the different types of leg ulcers but you can also categorize them in according to acute or chronic. So acute would be an ulcer that's been there for less than six weeks and chronic one which has been there for over six weeks. So let's look at the different etiologies now and we'll start with venous. So um, with venous leg ulcers you usually have a valve dysfunction of the veins. Now this can be due to, for example, increased ab um, intra-abdominal pressure, failure of the calf pumps, could be congenital varicose veins, and you could get um, people who've had DVTs before are also more prone to venous leg ulcers. What happens is that you get stasis of the blood. So fluid then leaks out of the veins under the skin. So with that, you get fibrin leak, red cell extravasation, and hemosiderin deposition. So that consequently leads to hyperpigmentation, which is obviously due to the iron pigments. You can get lipodermatosclerosis, and that's a type of dermatitis, which is followed by hardening and then dermal fibrosis. And you can also get atri blanche, which is when you have a smooth ivory white plaque and it's stippled with telangiectasia and surrounded by the hyperpigmentation. This eventually leads to ulceration, and you can also get damage to the superficial lymphatics and it's not uncommon to have peripheral edema. Looking at the etiology of arterial leg ulcers, what you get is you get damage to an artery and that, res that results in ischemia to the skin. So the sort of backgrounds you might have would be peripheral vascular disease, which is large vessel disease, diabetes mellitus, which is when you get small vessel disease, also something like vasculitis or rheumatoid arthritis leading to inflammation of the vessels or even scar tissue compression such as that what people might get with systemic sclerosis or radiotherapy and also trauma can lead to 
arterial ulcers. Looking now at the etiology for neuropathic leg ulcers, um, you might find in someone who has a sensory neuropathy that they then get trauma because you know they can't feel a stone in their shoe, for example, and that leads to trauma over time and the skin doesn't heal. Also, you can get motor neuropathies, um, which can lead to ulcers as well. So, for example, you might get small muscle wasting, which causes clawing of the toes. Um, you would be more likely to see this sort of ulceration in those with diabetes mellitus, and also malnutrition, such as vitamin B12 deficiencies. So let's look now at history, and in particular the history of presenting complaint. You would want to ask about onset, the duration, how long has the ulcer been there. Also ask the patients about pain, that's quite an, an important question, and of course you can go back to the Socrates mnemonic for that. You might want to ask them about trauma, and if you suspect peripheral vascular disease you can ask them about claudication distance. Looking in more detail at the past medical history now, so you'd want to ask them or you'd want to rule out peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, they might have had a stroke in the past, a heart attack or angina, or they might have varicose veins, they might have had a previous DVT, and they might have diabetes. Looking now at drug history, are they a steroid user? Also, are they compliant with their medications? such as the oral hypoglycemic agents and diabetes. Looking at social history, as ever, ask about smoking and alcohol. Now for examination, um, there are various things that you need to bear in mind, such as um, do you need to do a diabetic foot examination? Do you need to do a leg neuro examination? If it's venous insufficiency, you want to think about the Trendelenburg test, which is used to determine the site of valvular incompetence. So you would, you'd ask the patient to lie down, you'd elevate their leg, you'd empty the veins by um, massaging distally to proximally, and then use a tourniquet to occlude the superficial veins in the upper thigh. Then you ask the patient to stand. Now, if the tourniquet prevents the veins from refilling rapidly, then the site of the incompetent valve must be above this level. You'd also want to think about peripheral vascular disease examination, and then you might want to use the Burgers test. Now, a Burgers test is basically a test which tells you about the Burgers angle, and that's the angle to which the leg has been has has to be raised before it becomes pale. Now, in a limb with normal circulation, the toes stay pink, even when the limb's raised by 90 degrees. But in an ischemic leg, elevation to 15 or 30 or 30 degrees for 30 to 60 seconds may cause pallor. And a vascular angle of less than 20 degrees would indicate severe ischemia. So now looking more closely at examination of the ulcer itself, you want to see how many ulcers there are you need to look at the site. How big is it? And what's the base like? The edge, is that even or uneven? Is it deep or shallow? Sometimes you can even see down to the bone. Look at the shape of it, as well as the color. And look for corresponding edema. There might be eczema. And you might see signs of um, other vascular disease signs, such as, um, Bat poor peripheral pulses, shiny legs with no hair, which are very cold. You'd want to test sensation for looking at problems with neuropathies and also look for signs of infection like discharge or lymphadenopathy. So now looking at clinical assessment, the way I want to do this is just to compare how um, you would assess each type of ulcer, so comparing venous with arterial and with neuropathic ulcers. So in terms of history, with venous ulcers, you, would, you might find obesity, immobility, varicose veins, or someone who's previously had a DVT. In those with an arterial leg ulcer, you would find that they might have intermittent claudication, a history of hypertension, diabetes, or ischemic heart disease, and they might be a smoker. In those with neuropathic ulcers, you might get a history of numbness, a sensory neuropathy, 
again diabetes pops up here and maybe even a family history of these types of ulcers. Looking at the leg itself, in a venous leg ulcer, it would be, the skin would be pigmented, there'd be varicose veins, and the leg might be swollen and hot. In arterial leg ulcers, the leg might be shiny, hairless, cold, pale, parasthetic, and it would have diminished pulses. In neuropathic ulcer, when you look at the leg, you might see joint destruction. Now, looking at sight, with a venous leg ulcer, it tends to be more the medial aspects of the gator area, and that's sort of mid-calf to just below the malleoli. In an arterial ulcer, the site would might be somewhere like the lateral malleolus, the toes, or the dorsum of the foot, somewhere where there might be a poor blood supply. In neuropathic leg ulcers, the site might be the heel, it could be the metatarsal head, or pressure points. Now looking at the size, arteri um, venous leg ulcers sorry, can be very large. Arterial ulcers tend to be small, as do neuropathic ulcers. In terms of the base of the ulcer, with venous ulcers, they're usually superficial with a sloughy exudate over granulation tissue. When you compare that with arterial ulcers, the base tends to be quite deep and it's dry and dark and you see few signs of healing. The base of a neuropathic ulcer, well, I mean, you might even see the bone. It tends to be very deep. Now looking at the edge, so with venous leg ulcers, you look for an irregular and sloping edge and there might be areas of repeated healing and also exacerbation as well. The edge of an arterial ulcer tends to be well defined by contrast and it's often circular and it looks sort of punched out. Neuropathic ulcers, the edge is usually surrounded by thickened skin. And then you might want to um, assess sensation. So venous leg ulcers tend to be painful and they're relieved by elevation. Arterial ulcers are also painful but Con in contrast to venous ulcers, they're actually relieved by hanging the leg over the side of the bed, or rather the pain is relieved by doing that. Neuropathic ulcers, by contrast, are relatively painless. So now looking at investigations, and in the, um, the podmedics way of doing this, we look at cultures, bloods, imaging, biopsy, and then functional tests. So in terms of cultures, obviously swab the site. For bloods, think about doing FBC, C-reactive protein, you might want to do a fasting glucose or HbA1c, maybe a complement screen or other autoimmune screen. For imaging, um, you might want to do CT angiogram if you suspect arterial ulceration. And then we could do biopsy, especially in, a, in an ulcer that's not healing. So you might want to biopsy, for example, atypical areas. And then the, the functional test, which we all need to know how to do, is the ABPI, the Ankle Brachial Pressure Index. So just looking in a bit more detail at the ABPI, it's where you measure the brachial blood pressure in the usual way, but on both arms. And then you inflate the blood pressure cuff around the lower calf muscle, just above the ankle joint, and you put a Doppler ultrasound probe over the dorsalis pedis artery and then also the posterior tibial artery and the higher of the two pressures in either the DP or the PT artery is conventionally taken as the ABPI numerator and the higher of the two brachial pre pressures as a denominator. Now obviously you have to be careful where people might have calcified arteries and that will give a falsely elevated score. And that's often a question that pops up in, in the OSCE station at the end. So now looking at the scores, the ideal ABPI is 1. So it's where you've got press, equal pressures in the, uh, the arms and the legs. So a score of 1 or 1 1.2 would indicate no arterial insufficiency. A score of 0 0.8 to 1 would indicate mild arterial insufficiency and 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 would be moderate insufficiency and below 0 0.6 that is severe arterial insufficiency. And now looking at general management, 
Leg ulcers do tend to be managed a lot in the community with community nurses and also outpatient ulcer clinics where appropriate. So it's really good to highlight the importance of good nutrition and smoking cessation. You obviously want to treat the cause and you have to bear in mind that healing can take weeks to months. So address impaired mobility and social isolation and educate the patient, especially with regards to prevention of recurrence. So now I'm looking at specific management points. If we start with venous leg ulcers, uh, what, uh, what tends to work very well for those is compression bandages, especially, well, importantly, if the ABPI is over 0.8. And it's important that they are absorbent because that helps to dry out the slough. The ulcer might need debridement or even grafting. Emollients and steroid creams are often used in the community and patients are told to elevate the leg. And the, with regards to the compression bandaging, it tends to be graduated, one, especially once, it's, once the ulcer is healed, so you'd have higher pressure at the ankle. With arterial ulcers, you want to address the vascular risk factors, so we're, speaking, we're talking about lifestyle and medical issues. Give appropriate analgesia, and you might need to refer to a vascular surgeon to consider bypass or angioplasty. Compression and elevation is contraindicated in arterial ulcers, and it's really, really important that you know this. Now, the complications of arterial ulcers tend to be gangrene and might lead to amputation. For the specific management of neuropathic leg ulcers, you might need a diabetic foot team referral if the patient has diabetes. They need very careful foot care. And again, they also might need surgical debridement and also antibiotics because with neuropathic leg ulcers, osteomyelitis is quite common. And then obviously you want to treat any coexistent vascular disease. Now, if there's no improvement, you would have to consider other diagnoses. So rarely it might be TB, it could be cancer, or there just might be dermatitis as a complication from therapeutic agents. And in that situation, you would need to ask for a patch test. Send swabs of slow healing ulcers. The patient might have MRSA colonisation or strep or pseudomonas cellulitis. Importantly, refer to dermatology and they, would, they might want to consider a biopsy because there could be malignant change or an underlying carcinoma. And slow to improve leg ulcers might need curatage or skin graft. So in summary, leg ulcers are really common, especially in your dermatology placement, but they also feature in endocrinology, vascular and neurology placements. So know the three most common etiologies and the basic examination, history and investigation principles of each. Thank you very much.